Hello, and welcome to The Nature Connection, Science, Wildlife, and Environment Radio, with your hosts, Lisa and Nancy. Every time I hear that, I feel like at, at peace and calm in nature. Uh, welcome, everybody, to our Nature Connection show here with Nancy and Lisa. We're the crazy mother-daughter travel team. Uh, we travel across the country full-time documenting parks on our Love Your Parks tour, and also we publish two digital uh, publications. We've got Big Blend Radio and TV magazine that does cover nature and wildlife, and also Parks and Travel magazine. You can see them both at uh, bigblendmagazines.com. Today we're recording a podcast with naturalist David Parrish, and uh, we're actually we're sitting. It's a beautiful sunny day here in the desert. Yeah. We're just outside Joshua Tree National Park. We're at our friends in the historic uh, homestead in here in 29 Palms, California. Unfortunately, we can't be in the park because at this point the COVID virus shutdown is, is happening. Um, and I'm excited because David has written a book. It's called The Gyroscope of Life, Understanding Balance and Imbalances mm. in Nature. So I want to ask, is that, is, yeah, does like that go it. to politics? Anyway, <laughs> but it releases through Pocahontas Press in June 2020. I encourage you to go to their website, Pocahontas Press. Dot com, uh, But, you know, when you talk with anybody who's into science, biology, and nature, you know you do want to talk about viruses and things, too, but especially his book. But welcome, David. How are you? I'm fine, Lisa. Thank you very much for inviting me to join your listeners on Nature Connection. Yeah. And hello, Nancy. Mm. You know, this is cool because it says science in there. How often do you get to hear science podcasts, <laughs> you know, for the general public? <laughs> And not just, you know, yes. you know, folks like us that geek out on it, you know. Um, but I love the title of your book, The Gyroscope of Life. And, I, you know, the, as soon as I saw the title, I was like, I wonder how many people can even remember, like, a gyroscope, thinking about cells, thinking about all those things that we don't see to the naked eye half of the time. Um, and I think that's kind of your, your premise of the book is we don't always see what's going on in nature. We we, we do not. And, and I think maybe I... Well, I grew up loving gyroscopes. There was a toy that I grew up with as a boy, and uh, I'm not sure that people relate to gyroscopes as much as I do. Uh, do. Do you know gyroscope? I know remember having having one, but I remember our, my brother was really cool. Like he could put it like in the palm of his hand, and it would keep spinning, and I couldn't uh-huh, do that's that. It. Yeah, he That's could it, do that. Yes. And could, yeah, and then he later he became a gymnast. So he had that, like, balance thing. I couldn't do it. Yes. I mean, it was always like, oh, well, bye. <laughs> yeah. I had the, a gyroscope. The fascinating... yeah. I'm sorry? I said I had okay. one, too, as a kid. A gyroscope oh, okay, and a microscope. Good. And a microscope. Okay. Yeah. Great, great. yeah. Well, the, fa- the, fasc- the fascinating thing to me about the gyroscope was, and still is, that you could set that little wheel spinning, and then mm-hmm. set the whole device at any angle you wanted to, and you would think it would tip over. It's so tilted, and yet it remains in that position. As long as that wheel is spinning, there is that balance uh, mm. that it that it has that uh, makes it a just a, a marvelous demonstration of the laws of physics, actually. But it, it, it makes, a, for me, a great metaphor of trying to explain or understand what's going on in life as well. So would you use it to explain our solar system? Well, it certainly has elements of that. Uh, I hadn't thought of it that way. I was really applying it throughout this book anyway to uh, various levels of of complexity of life, from the cellular level on up to a a whole plant or animal, such as you or me. Uh, Mm -hmm. But it applies or can be used to describe what's going on at the level of of ecosystems, there's a balance mm-hmm. uh, there mm-hmm. that that is, to me, gyroscopic like. At least that makes a, for me, a, a cool metaphor. Yeah, you know, and and I love you know you you have one section of your book, plant or animal, and mm-hmm. I really I caught myself up. <laughs> You know, here we are documenting parks, and we're learning about all these different plants and animals that we've never heard of, or, you know, and in, especially Nancy and I, you know, lived yeah. in Africa for a majority of our lives, and, and you know, so you're getting all these different species. Some species look similar or will be related, 
you know, so it's an interesting thing for us. But I totally forgot that fungus is not, it, you know, fungus and uh, lichen and all of that, it's different than the plants. And when I, you know, was writing some articles on wildflowers and going through the national park websites and going, okay, trying to get all the species names correct, they would go, hey, um, by the way, the fungus is under the plant section, but remember, it's not a plant. And I'm like, dude, then what is it? And I like that you have a plant yes. or animal section because we have tweeners. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Well, the the fact is, for a couple of thousand years, we thought about well, longer than that probably, everything that we knew that was alive was either a plant or an animal. Mm-hmm. That was, you know, from Aristotle's time on and going back behind Aristotle, uh, all living things were either plants or animals. Um, yeah. But as we began to learn more about biology, and especially as our technology became better, we realized there were some things that weren't either plant animals. I'm picking out know, things that you could see in that microscope that you got. You could mm-hmm. perhaps see some bacteria in there and, and things yeah. that weren't clearly, you know, the things that we describe as plants or animals. And when technology advanced or when science actually advanced more, what we discovered was that, oh, Fungi, which we've always thought of as plants, are really more like animals than they are mm. plants. As far as their biochemistry is concerned, they are more like animals than, and more like us than they are like a daffodil. So, it's, it's, well, isn't this okay? I'm probably going to get in trouble here, but go ahead. Let's oh, get in trouble. Yeah, let's go. Let's go right to it. Go, girl. So, isn't it kind of like when you're looking at something? Um, like a mushroom or something like that, and it, you know, it's like leans towards the plant, but well, not really. Fungi over here, mushroom over there, the little steps of evolution. Possibly. Fungi to the left, fun girl to the right. Yeah, it's Sorry. like, yeah, <laughs> it's like, isn't it really evolutionary steps between, you know, well, evolutionary steps? Yes, yes. These are all parts of the tree of life. Yeah. As it's sometimes called. Uh, and, uh, Fungi are off on their own branch. They have a, a, a branch that's separate from the branch that we, that you and I are on, the animal and all other animals on, and that is separate from the branch that the uh, the plants are on. And, and of so course, then you... go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Well, I, I was just going to say, and then of course the the bacteria and uh, other forms are are on separate branches themselves. But we're all related back down at the base of this tree of life. We all See? have common ancestors. Yeah. So then the duck built platypus. <laughs> okay, she, she's stuck in the, the – she's star, stuck in Darwin. So I'm so stuck in Darwin. It's so funny. <laughs> <laughs> I really, you know, when you look at the duck-billed platypus, you're like, okay, that somebody just got mad one night and threw you all together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it it does have that appearance. It, it has some some characteristics that make it look like a mammal. It's got hair and so mm. forth, but then it's got that crazy looking nose on it, that bill. Yeah, it looks mm. much more like a bird. Uh, so yes, it, it is a, an interesting example of how evolution can come up with some interesting solutions to living in particular environments. Okay, so now I have to go go to hyenas because they're hermaphrodite. No, I want to bring this up because people shy away from this all the time. So, David, I I have to bring this up. And Nancy was talking about, was it wallabies or wombats the other day? And how marsupials are totally like, they're almost like they can reproduce themselves almost. And so when you think about evolution, are are these species or like families of animals, are they in that zone where eventually do you think we're really, because we separate male and female and you go, you have male or female in, in your book too. And everyone, the gyroscope yes. of life, you got to go get it. Um, you bring this up. And so when you, we talk about hyenas, it freaks people out. And yeah. I mean, it, I grew up <laughs> with hyenas running around, you know, cool. in the bush, you okay. know, in Kenya. <laughs> But um, yes. so they're very, I don't know, I love them. I think they're really, really they're fascinating because awesome. they do hunt, but they're also scavengers, but they're also hermaphrodites, and that's like they're trippy animals. And even mm-hmm. the way their back legs are kind of like sloped, they, they're sloped. They're like different. Yes. They, I think they are, they are weird like looking werewolves. animals. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Do you think this is mm-hmm. evolution? Right. 
Oh, I think that we're all products of, revo- yeah. of evolution, yes. That uh, uh, Mother Nature, if mm-hmm. we can personify evolution, that uh, Mother Nature designed creatures to fit into particular niches within their mm-hmm. ecosystems, and, and the hyena is obviously very well suited, very successful, and, yeah. and therefore very well suited to filling out a particular role within mm-hmm. those ecosystems where we find it. And it, I, you know, you're telling me something I didn't know. I'm, I'm, I'm a, a botanist, really, more than a, than a, 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 a zoologist. But uh, I was not aware, really, that uh, that was that, that bit. It's the norm for hyenas to be hermaphroditic. It is for oh, plants, yeah. by the way. Ninety-five percent you know, of plants are. It, what, it, what's interesting about hyenas is that people always characterize them as cowards. And I'm just going to tell you, if you've ever met one in the middle of the bush and you're walking on your own, hell no. There are no cowards. <laughs> hell no. Yeah. Uh-huh. Well, this is well, I, I haven't be... met one personally, no. <laughs> oh, they're awesome. They're they're so fascinating. They're they're sound at night. Like when you go to sleep, you'll hear them. Like they do this, Ooh, like they kind of sound like monkey like too. Mm-hmm. But being on the botanist side, I love the story about you uh, being out there. You know, in the military, serving the military, and you know, it, it's that's how you got your degree. But also. You're, here you are off with a camera and a, and a plant press. You know, it's like, here, let's ride a tank and then jump over here and go look at a plant. <laughs> so, you know, I have appreciation for that. But when you talk about plants and evolution, this mm. is an interest. I'm, I'm like looking at, like, the whole evolution thing, I think we with religion kind of like shunned it aside and then if if there's an agreement of evolution happened i mean you know we went from cave people to now what we are you know human being wise standing up a little bit bigger and all of that i think there's a side of us that religion stopped the conversation of evolution and and doesn't want to look at what we are as evolving but i also think there's evolution in regards to how plants and animals and birds how communication is happening how um you know birds are changing how they get their food Mm -hmm. plants are changing even just because of human factors of changing it a plant a native plant and adapting it and playing hey i'm sorry but we're playing god so that we can have a garden that looks manicured you know what i mean Mm -hmm. so i feel like evolution is not just that natural thing that we would see in in natural history books but evolution is now and Humans are creating evolution. We we are the 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 whole process of domestication, whether we're mm, talking about plants mm-hmm. or or animals, is yeah. really a human directed evolution. Some of it was perhaps thought through. A lot of it, I think, was just by sheer accident, by happenstance, so that the first agriculturalists, the first people who began to farm, who learned how to take seeds and throw them in the ground rather than in their mouth and then to grow more plants. They mm-hmm. began to shape the way those plants moved evolutionarily. Uh, mm. So, for example, and th- this is to me fascinating, if you think about the, the plants, the, the, the uh, vegetables that we call coal crops, these mm-hmm. are things like cabbage and broccoli and cauliflower and kohlrabi and kale and others, those are all members of the same species. As different as they Mm -hmm. look, they all Mm -hmm. arose within the last 10,000 years at most from a single common source. It's a a plant that is still a weed in the Mediterranean region. But over... Many human generations, people selected for mutants, you know, Mm -hmm. the the natural changes that occur from one generation to another, selected for mutants that were more like cabbage or more like cauliflower or more like broccoli. And we ended up with those many different kinds of plants that are really all still the same species that, that, that led to their domestication. You know, dogs are an example from the animal world. Think about how different dogs are. They're all the same species. Like look at a wolf Uh, and a chihuahua. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, They, they, they are, well, wolves now technically are often in a different species, but all dogs are in the same 
had the same Latin binomial species, species, genus species name. Uh, but there are dogs that look very much like wolves, but there are also dogs like chihuahuas. They're all mm. the same species. And, and mm. they are, by the way, domesticated in the sense that they wouldn't continue to exist without human inputs. You know, can you imagine chihuahuas surviving in the in the wild? Now I gotta run down an elk. And... <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, they're yappy and they will yeah, bite your ankle. Little ankle snappers <laughs> yeah. going after antelope. Yeah, yeah. right. Now that's yeah. funny. You know, but the next, it is. Yeah. It's interesting the domesticated part of it because, or domestication part. Of it, you know, because that with. Crops, and I know that's you know a big specialty of yours is looking at agriculture mm. and looking at modern agriculture, and you know I, I don't know. I think this whole mono crop thing is dangerous. We talk about it a lot on our shows mm-hmm. and the chemicals, and then it's like it seems like the super bugs or worms come back bigger and stronger every time you give it a chemical, mm-hmm. and you know we just um, our our travels to different parks like Pinnacles National Park in Central California, they are working with uh, re. They're they're rehabilitating the condors, California condors, and a lot of the reason yeah. they you know died off was because we used lead bullets, and it's kind of the same as mm-hmm. what we're doing with crops. And you know, I, I wonder about now where where do you think we should be going? Is it more organic? Is it more of our backyard, or should we be looking at like hydroponics and things like that? Well, uh, for the last well. For my, most of my professional life, I billed myself as an agronomist. I worked in the department that was called agronomy initially, and it changed its name to crop and soil environmental sciences. Uh, I'm kind of considered a, considered a renegade within my profession because I do not see the way we are doing agriculture currently as being sustainable. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah. It, it, it is not something that we – yeah, we are doing an okay job, if you please, of uh, feeding 7.7 billion of us right now. But mm-hmm. the way we're doing it, we cannot continue to do ad infinitum. And to be sustainable, it would have to be something, by my definition of sustainability anyway, it would have to be doing business in a way that could be done perpetually, forever. Mm-hmm. And but- when you look at how we're doing agriculture, it's just not going to last forever. Well, I don't see how it can. You know, I think when if we go back to like pre World War Two, people had victory gardens and they they knew that they had they possibly might run out of food and they had their own little backyard gardens, not maybe acres mm-hmm. and acres, but they had enough mm-hmm. of a patch to grow their own food. And I feel like that's where we're going to have to head back to um, community gardens if you're living in an apartment, and a lot of apartments actually, like complexes, have a community garden now. They're starting to compost, even yeah, apartment it, complexes, it, some of them. Right, yeah. it is because we're going to yeah. have to do something uh, you know, to, to yeah. make sure that we have a food supply. And, and then I look at the things like because we spent time in, in Yuma and we watched what happened with the peanuts and the crop and they didn't have white fly until they put all the peanuts in big long rows and took acres and acres, and they they called in a pest that had never been to Yuma before because of the concentration of one kind of plant. Yes. And and yes. so then they yes. had to come up with a yeah a way to get rid of the white fly, and they weren't as successful mm-hmm. uh, getting rid of it as they were calling it in. I'm just saying. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, monocultures are inherently. Not the way Mother Nature would go. Not the way Mother exactly. Nature has gone. If you, if you, when you compare the how we do agriculture to natural ecosystems, yeah, uh, there's just no real comparison, unfortunately. Uh, there, there is a well. If you do the math, the math mm-hmm. is pretty straightforward. There's about three and a half billion acres of readily farmable land. That is, the soils are suitable. They're level enough. There's water available, et cetera, et cetera. And when you divide that by 7.7 billion people, that says there's about a half an acre per mouth hmm. to feed hmm. us. Uh, and and uh, it's hmm. doable when you when yeah. you look at what can be grown on a half an acre. It's doable, but yeah, uh, 
it's hard, for, and this is the dilemma for me. It's hard to imagine us going back to those ways of farming, of subsistence farming, mm, when yeah. there's 7.7 billion of us. They're, they're just, in my opinion, there are too many of us. Mm-hmm. Yes. Our our our, our, our root problem is that <laughs> we we have we have exceeded, in my opinion. And the opinion of, of many others, and, and by the way, I'm stepping outside of an area that's strictly biology here, so mm-hmm. you know, take take it for whatever it's worth. But uh, in my opinion, we have exceeded the planet's carrying capacity. There are mm-hmm. that the carrying capacity is a technical, if you please, uh, ecological term, but we have exceeded the number of people that the plant can support ad infinitum. Right. That is sustainably. Do you um, think that right now, like when you look at something like COVID nineteen, that we're dealing with this, everyone's in a shutdown mode, and you know, and it's a global situation where I look at this yeah. in a way of it being it's horrible, and and I'm sorry for you know the the deaths, and and so I'm I'm not being callous, but when we're talking science biology, there is a mathematic thing here of, and also a um, eye opening thing like one. I think this is one of the few times that the world is connected in a way of under yes. and it's sad but it's like oh yeah we're connected we're connected well, right down to the tiniest little micro the thing that you can't see right unless you have the the you know the microscope we're connected that yes. far away in covid you can't see it right um, unless yeah. you get the little bacteria thingy out and look at it um, the microscope right. thing right <laughs> so we've got that so now it's a danger and then there's that side of me that says okay, like all the parks are closed right now, the National Park Service parks, right? And there's that side of me that goes, okay, in a way, that's cool because now the parks are getting to breathe from human foot tra- footsteps, human traffic, um, you know, uh-huh. cars, uh-huh. and um, being just, you know, people ruin parks. And we're the park advocates, and we want people out in parks, but there's this reprieve for nature. And it, the other part of me goes, do you think nature has this way of like, dude, we've got too many people on earth now. It's time to clean up. I'm, I'm, you know, like, I'm going in. I feel like that. Like n- mother nature yeah. says, yeah. well, I'm, I'm, I, you know, I need to take a shower and some of you are going to, you know, jump in the boiling pot for something when it happens. Yes. Well, I, I, I absolutely do believe it. And it, it's, it's very loaded when we talk about this in human terms, when we talk about thinning mm-hmm. out the herd. But in fact, if you just look at what goes on out there with all the other animals, humans mm-hmm. aside, something like this happens. Something if, if the well, my favorite park is Yellowstone, mm. and if if you know the story of the elk populations in Yellowstone mm-hmm. National Park, uh, that to me illustrates very well how Mother Nature deals with. Overpopulation. Uh, should, should I recite that story of, of, sure, of how, what ahead, happened ahead, with the elk? Uh, it, because it, I could run on for a little while here. Be sure and cut in and, and, and uh, make sure Don't I'm, tell I'm being us clear. That. <laughs> <laughs> Please do. But uh, in, in any event, uh, for a variety of reasons, in the early 1900s, we said about we. Our species set about to eliminate gray wolves from the mm-hmm. Yellow, greater Yellowstone ecosystem. That includes the Yellowstone National Park and more geography. Uh, and, and the wolves were eliminated. And within several years, and by the way, grizzly bear populations were reduced too. Those exactly. are the primary predators for mm-hmm. elk. Yep. And what was observed over the next several decades was that the elk populations boomed, yeah. especially the overwintering elk mm-hmm. in the Yellow, greater Yellowstone Park, or greater Yellowstone ecosystem. And uh, because their numbers were so great, they began to browse on the aspens, and they began to browse down all the vegetation around the streams, et cetera, et cetera, and the whole ecosystem suffered. But so also yeah. did the elk. Uh, mm-hmm. Their fertility levels went down, disease mm-hmm. levels went up, etc. Uh, wolves were reintroduced in the 90s, 
guess what happened to the elk population? Does he, it, it went you down. It, you just balance, can't do this. The, that's the balance thing. The balance was restored when we let the wolves back in to mm-hmm. repopulate that niche that we had it, eradicated. You know, sometimes, you know, the people who make these decisions, I wonder how much do they really know about the the wildlife that they're attempting to manage. And, for example, I learned in Kenya, which was in the South Africa, like the, let's take the kudu, for example, only eats really one kind of leaf, and mm-hmm. it can only eat so much of a leaf off of one particular plant before that plant makes its leaves instantly more bitter so that yeah. the, browser, the browser has to move on and go to a different plant so that plant can survive. And it's so, Mother so, Nature is smart. Yeah, it's so intricate. But then we come in as humans with, with none of this knowledge or maybe we don't care because money comes first. Just going to say that. So we're just going to go, you know, bring out the the pruners, and we don't feel anything by chopping down things we know nothing about because it's in our way. Yeah. And so I think there's much have... more that we don't know than that we do know. Quite mm, frankly, it, it, we know so. I doubt that we know one tenth about the plants on on this earth. I doubt if we even know ten percent mm. that of what we need to know. I, I, I of, of it, yes, of what is to be known. Yeah, we're still learning. Lots to yeah. learn. And, okay, go into plants, right? So the plants to me are really fascinating, and I, that's what I really love about your work is that I think that we look at plants and, and it always goes under the horticulture thing, and I love gardens and gardening and plants. And I always wanted to write a book about, like, the history of plants and kind of showcase, like, this is what the potato used to look like in nature, <laughs> you know. I love it. And bring mm-hmm. it to what we've done uh-huh. now. Look at corn. Look how corn, yeah. we can't even, you know, take corn and plant corn from the corn you buy in a grocery store. It doesn't work. So there's all these right. things we've done, and I've always wanted to write a book of, and, like, get, like, historic images, and I don't know, because plants, to me, it is the most, they are like the canary of the planet because of the soil. We um, we stayed on a ranch once, and they're really mm-hmm. doing this work on uh, they understand they have this uh, they do this holistic ranch style of things and they have all these meetings of all these yes. scientists and this is mm. important i think the more the word scientist that is that that individual out there really studying we need to listen more we and more facts. we need to have the facts we can't right. not have science on yeah. tv radio shows and, and it needs to be part of the political system, it needs to be part of the voting system, it needs to be part of educating people so that we can make these decisions in life personally and, you know, just for communities. But they were saying that here they are surrounded by agriculture and they do some agriculture and lamb and um, they, a little bit of everything, right? So they're doing that that web of life mm-hmm. and down uh-huh. the road from them is this giant organic farm. So you think, oh, these are all organic farms when you go to this area. <laughs> and they started doing soil testing with them, and they're saying that even the organic farms, because it's monocrop, right, even if it's organic, mm-hmm. that soil is depleted. Yep. And, so, and that it's also because the whole connection thing, the soil, even from the organic farms, that is now, mm-hmm. it sucks, right? There's no nutrients left. That it's because that doesn't have nutrients that that is actually harming, like, nature around the corner and, mm-hmm. the, and like, just where it's wild land, that whatever yes. we're doing there actually connects back to the soil down the road, and you wouldn't think that because you think, oh, well, the, yeah. we put up a fence. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know duh. I mean? yeah. That really makes Well, it whenever, we, whenever we are <laughs> farming commercially, whether it's being done organically or being done conventionally, or being done by biotechnology. Whenever we are farming commercially, we are taking stuff away from that land. Whenever we haul a crop to market, we're hauling away the nutrients that were in that soil. And exactly. they've, they've got to be replaced. But but we are, in fact, borrowing uh, from the soil, or actually taking from the soil, the stuff that Mother Nature put in there, but mm-hmm. that puts on us the onus of continually replacing these things. And that ultimately 
when you think about where we have to go to get those nutrients to replace them, is I'm sorry, it's simply not sustainable. We are going to run out of the eventually run out of those the phosphate and the potassium and exactly. the other nutrients that we need to put back in the soil. Because where are we getting that? You know, mm-hmm. where are we getting the minerals yeah. that have to go back to what we just took away? Mm-hmm. You know, and, right. And well, we have to go to Canada or to Mexico yeah. or wherever, and and go down a mile deep to find them in those layers, exactly. and then haul them thousands of miles to put on, on the ground. And you know, I'm, I'm sorry. It, the, the problem again, I think. In my humble opinion, is that there's just too damn many of us. And I don't know the solution to that, but if we're going to continue to feed those, we've got to continue to do farming the way we're doing it. I, I don't well, when think I, when that. I was a kid, um, when I was a kid, I, you know, and growing up in Kenya, everybody was like, oh, you know, the starving kids in Africa, and they are. It's a very real situation. Um, but I remember, you know, I was raised very much out in the bush and doing, you know, nature stuff, and, you know, I started to really read as I was getting old and older into biology and ecology, and then you know I didn't I didn't understand that I was in ecology all the time. Like that was who I was. This environmentalist part comes uh-huh. out as as you grow and, and become a, a mature person. I don't know if I'm mature yet, but anyway. <laughs> but, I, you know. but now what I'm, I'm great, you know <laughs> I'm midlife now, right? I'm getting there or whatever. Uh-huh. I don't know. Um, it's there, um, but it's. Um, Interesting because when I was 17 years old and I was watching all my friends, you know, this is back in the early 90s, all my friends, you know, basically getting married, having children. I mean, all of it was planned even as they were graduating. You know, this thing was already Uh going on. uh And I was like, hell no. And (laughs) I'm not doing that. And I made a decision (laughs) then that I would never have a child. And and if it happened in my life or I adopted one or it, it did happen, of course I would embrace yeah. it but um and do it. But I made this decision. It was this whole organization. I read this thing on uh overpopulation and there was like mm-hmm. this, you know, uh take the pledge of zero population growth. Like don't be don't add to it. And I made this choice yes. and I've stuck by it. I mean to the point of like n- like I don't even go on dates or anything anymore. I travel and look at nature. Okay. I mean, I'm just like it's not happening, and I refuse. <laughs> I refuse because of this. Because I don't, you know, and I don't want to put chemicals in my body other than wine, you know, and, and the and tequila once in a while. Yes. That to prevent uh-huh. it, I'm like I want to. Be, I I don't want that, and that's okay. Kind of I commend system. you, Lisa. I commend you. I know that, people that, get mad I, at I me. I wish though. many more people. Yeah. Well. <laughs> Here's uh, it, it's not only that it, it, we it's have a loaded so many. sort of issue. Mm-hmm. It, it we live so much longer, mm. and we have an yes. emphasis in this culture of living as long as possible. Okay, so mm-hmm. not mm-hmm. only are we it, we have so many more people than the Earth can carry, but we're also living a lot longer. So mm-hmm. I do think there is a solution to that. That is humane. In that, um, you grow your own veggies. Just start growing your own garden because people have take out the oh I want to swear take out the lawns, just get rid of the lawns. Grow some nice flowers so you can look pretty from street view. Behind the flowers, grow some vegetables and feed your family something with with the right soil, and Uh um, you know and do that and don't reproduce. For those who have the ability, that's great. I really agree totally. Yeah. Yes. And but are we allowed? Okay, David. Though is it wrong? Like you know, because I rarely talk about this on the show about like the zero population growth. Like, can we <laughs> just say like, come on, like think about it before you do it? You know. Oh, hello. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm just saying. Uh, yeah, I talk yeah, to you well. Yeah. I know I'm going to get in trouble <laughs> after this, but I mean it. Well, we probably all will. But but I, I yeah, I think there, as I said, they're just. Too many of us. We we have exceeded the planet's carrying capacity. Yeah. It's already beginning to affect us. You know, but something do we like care because a ninth of the world's live... people are going to bed hungry every night. But sorry, do we care? This is the thing. Do we actually care? Because are, do are we so selfish that we only care about us and our own family possibly, and we're going to live at somewhere between? 60 to maybe 100 years. Do we really care as long as that 60 to 100 years is okay for us? 
I think the the, the problem just seems too enormous. It, it, it's something you know. How how do you address this? How do we solve a problem of having seven point seven billion of us living on this earth, and maybe there should only be two billion yeah. or less? Uh, and then we think it's more you know, precious too. We'd have, we'd think about life being more precious too. Yes. I think things are taken so for granted now, and this is kind of the way the the this pandemic thing is. I kind of think people are starting to think about you know things a little bit more than being so rushed and and actually have some gratitude for life. You know. Mhm. Mhm. Just well, okay. Mm-hmm. If you're in the hospital right now and you've got uh, people with the virus and you don't have enough respirators. And you have to make a choice: who gets what respirator, who gets them, and it's who doesn't. Horrible. How do you, you know? Mm-hmm. That's, yeah, man. Yeah. It's it, it's it's we've yeah we've but this is the whole thing about what you've written and everyone again it's out gyroscope go get it uh, the gyroscope of life understanding balances and imbalances we're talking about that now in nature I love it because you really show the web of life and that's mm. something that um, I think. The more we can teach kids this, you know, and I think your book is a way that Uh because you tell your personal stories that people can identify with things, maybe, you know, getting out in nature when they were kids. But the more we can do that and get the adults involved with the kids, you know, to understand and have that joy of looking at a bug, looking at a bee on a plant, you know, I think that's what's beautiful. And appreciating life, yeah, appreciating Mm -hmm. life, all life. The, the whole collective uh, we're, we tend to be thinking of life as just what's tied up in homo sapiens but uh, mm. life is so much more than that and unfortunately homo sapiens are we homo sapiens are screwing it up mm. Mm. Uh, I know and we're in the, my we're humble the opinion with, we're the ones with the thought mm. you know we always say animals don't really have the thinking process that we do you know mm-hmm. and that may or may not be true in my own opinion about what animals think, feel. I think we're more intelligent than most, but we also but, have, with that intelligence, developed technologies that are just raping the world. Yeah. So how uh, intelligent it, it, are we? Raping then? nature. Yeah, well, right we're, we're not being intelligent in our use of technologies. Absolutely. I would agree. That's for sure. I want to ask you, because I know that you're up in the Appalachia side of the world, the Appalachia side of the world, and, uh-huh. and they live on 30 acres in the hole in the woods, right? Cool. Now, yes, yes, that's our place. Have cool. you noticed on your land any changes? You know, like just living out there, is there any change through the years that you've seen and, and witnessed because, you know, of human life or what's it, what's it oh, like? Oh, yeah. It's going to be cool. I had, I had the almost religious experience uh, 50 years ago of uh, going out and standing in a uh, probably a 100-acre uh, plot of virgin timber mm. in the eastern here, – here in the Appalachians. This was in an area where the trees were, some of them, 20 feet in diameter wow. and uh, 200 feet or more mm. tall. These were – Huge poplars and oaks and and other trees and then the understory was was gorgeous in its own way, but it, it, the the experience was kind of like walking into a cathedral in in uh, in Europe, you know, with these huge columns and the ceilings that go to mm-hmm. you know infinity almost. It seems like that's what this ecosystem used to look like. Uh, this I'm mm-hmm. I'm getting back to answering your question. I've gone off on a tangent here, but what we I can have. say about <laughs> what I've observed, yeah, what I've observed on our little 30 acres is that it's slowly moving back toward that. Uh, it it cool. is was cleared uh, before we bought the land. Probably 20 or 30 years before we bought the land, it was clear cut, oh. uh, and then and then just left to grow willy nilly. Uh, hmm. Mother Nature does have a good way of of covering up those scars, but uh, mm-hmm. it takes a long time to get yeah. back to a stand like I stood in. And it's you know we're still probably if it were allowed to continue uh, hundreds of years from getting back to that state. But hmm. I can testify that in the time I've observed it in the last you know 
20 plus years that we've lived on uh, at Hole in the Woods, it's, it's, you know, Mother Nature is doing her thing. It's moving back toward that pristine state. That's It'll amazing. Make it because somebody is, yeah. We, we, when someone lets it be, it's it's interesting to me to be able to watch that. You know, um, Greg Gaffin, he's a the lead um, musician in the band Bad Religion, and he wrote a book that also kind of deals with this issue that we have. And he has a big piece of land up in Maine. I think it's in Maine. I can't remember. Uh-huh. It was a long time ago that I read his book, and he was talking about like he has ancient fossils on his property oh, and cool. bones cool. and things, and oh. he won't let people take them out. Good. And people are mad at him because yeah. he's like, no, we need to just let nature do whatever it is mm-hmm. and just yep. leave it yep. and get the hell over it. <laughs> he's just like, let it mm-hmm. be. And all these, you know, people want to dig things up, and he's like, nope, we're leaving it. I'm not touching it. Everybody else does this Good and that him. to their land over the season. Yeah. And he's like, I don't care. You know, I don't care if it all turns to oil and no one touches that. That's what it's going to do. And let nature yeah. have its process. And yeah. he won't touch anything on his land. And it really bugs people, you know, that he won't garden or whatever. And, and he's really learned. No. It changed his whole life. And, it, and it's well, interesting that his does... band name is Bad Religion. Because mm-hmm. you know? <laughs> I also read, you know, reading about your you he's know, childhood. He's got some good things there. Yeah, there's yeah. some good things. But it's... it's um, the interesting thing when you look at um, religion and where we are today, and I think that's something that is rarely talked about, and I really applaud you for for bringing light to this because it is a different and it it, it oh I'm going to so get in trouble. It's almost like it shouldn't be ignored because it is something that every culture has uh, some kind of belief system. And it's very interesting that they all kind of align in some ways, even though we have to fight and kill yeah. each other over it. But it is about how baby, too many babies are produced. <laughs> and there is that part of it. And it really harms education, I think, when um, religion and, you know, science and the cloth. But I feel like now we're getting better at that. Do you feel that, that we're getting better at science? And I think, I think there's some growing awareness. I, I, I'm a little discouraged sometimes that there has been this anti-science, if you please, oh, movement yeah. uh, that that mm-hmm. is has grown mm-hmm. in some circles. It's it's partly political, but it, there are other yeah. overtones to it, in my opinion. Uh, mm-hmm. But uh, I would hope that as we make decisions in the future about where we want to go, we will use good science. To make those decisions, absolutely. And, uh, and, and and I am encouraged that yes, to get back to your question is that that maybe we are the pendulum starting to swing the other way, and and that now science is again getting its due. Uh, mm. But we'll, we'll see. Yeah, it takes I'm the virus, I'm, right? I'm hopeful. Yeah, well, I think well, I think what, what I, that, I think it's interesting. You know, here we are in the middle of a, a virus, and everybody's running to the doctor. Hello, there's scientists. Hello. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Wakey, wakey, people. They've mm-hmm. been saying something Hello. for a while. Hello. <laughs> for a while, but you know, well, we really yes. appreciate that you've you know written this book, and everyone again, it's the gyroscope of life. Understanding Balances and Imbalances in Nature it releases in June through Pocahontas Press. So you can go to PocahontasPress.com. Uh, you, of course, Amazon, all those places end up with books, right? But it's also great to really support your local bookstore and go to your bookshop and say, hey, can you order this for us? And uh, that's a really good way of – remember, we're all in it together. And that's we it. We've got to support our small – our small businesses mm-hmm. and independent authors, independent publishing houses, as best we can. So, again, PocahontasPress.com is the website to go to. We want to thank you, David. Uh, everyone, again, it's David Parrish, uh, who's the author and uh, naturalist. Thank you so much for joining us. I wish we were sitting in the woods having wine or beer, in right. your case, uh, mm-hmm. you know, together. Yes. Because it, yeah, <laughs> but we'd solve all the world's problems. Yeah, we would. <laughs> we could take we over. Would. <laughs> we could take it all over. We could talk about them anyway. Well, thank you, Lisa and Nancy. I have really enjoyed being on Nature Connection. 
Thank you so much. And audience, thank you for joining us. You can keep up with our shows and podcasts at bigblendradio.com. And we always love to play uh, special music for our guests and, of course, for you, our listeners. And today's song, which we haven't played in a while, and I love it, it's called Loving the Land, and it's from Wally Lauder. He's a singer-songwriter based out of Tucson. So keep up with him at wallylauder.com. But here it is, Loving the Land. Thanks so much, David. Thanks, David. Mm-hmm. Bye-bye. Well, I'm sitting on my back porch My guitar in my hand And I'm looking at the afternoon I'm looking at the land It's got that honey-colored light Golden rose reflecting from the sun She steps outside and asks me What are you doing, hon? And I'm loving the land I'm just loving the land corner, must have Buddha at my side, and if I had any worries, I've left them all behind, maybe it's the time of day, maybe it's the light, blame it on the air. But I couldn't feel more right And I'm loving the land I'm just loving the land I'm loving the land I'm just loving the land I'm just loving the land. 